How had she played that dreadful last scene? Had she cursed him as she died? No, she had died for love of him, and love would always be a sacrament to him now. She had atoned for everything by the sacrifice she had made of her life. He would not think any more of what she had made him go through on that horrible night at the theater. When he thought of her, it would be as a wonderful tragic figure sent onto the world stage to show the supreme reality of love. A wonderful tragic figure. Tears came to his eyes as he remembered her childlike look in winsome, fanciful ways and shy, tremulous grace. He brushed them away hastily and looked again at the picture. He felt that the time had really come for making his choice, or had his choice already been made? Yes, life had decided that for him. Life and his own infinite curiosity about life. Eternal youth, infinite passion, pleasures subtle and secret, wild joys and wilder sins. He was to have all of these things. The portrait was to bear the burden of his shame. That was all. You know? That's interesting, too. Um, he's decided to be evil, to, to have the eternal life and all the joys uh, that he ever wanted to have, and that, you know, the portrait was to bear the burden of his shame. That was all. He doesn't have to bear the burden. The portrait's separate from himself. Um, so he can throw all of his sins onto the portrait and not worry about how they affect him at all. It's just the portrait, after all. Uh, a feeling of pain crept over him as he thought of the desecration that was in store for the fair face on the canvas. Once, in boyish mockery of Narcissus, he had kissed or feigned to kiss those painted lips that now smiled so cruelly at him. Morning after morning, he had sat before the portrait, wondering at its beauty, almost enamored of it as it seemed to him at times. Was it to alter now with every mood to which he yielded? Was it to become a monstrous and loathsome thing? To be hidden away in a locked room? To be shut out from the sunlight that had often touched it to brighter gold? The waving wonder of its hair? The pity of it. The pity of it. For a moment, he thought of praying that the horrible sympathy that existed between him and the picture might cease. It had changed in answer to a prayer. Perhaps in answer to a prayer, it might remain unchanged. And yet, who that knew anything about life would surrender the chance of remaining always young, however fantastic that chance might be? Or what fateful consequences it might be fraught with? Besides, was it really under his control? Had it indeed been prayer that had produced the substitution, might there not be some curious scientific reason for it all? If thought could exercise its influence upon a living organism, might not thought exercise an influence upon a dead and inorganic thing? Nay, without thought or conscious desire, might not things external to ourselves vibrate in unison with our moods and passions, Adam calling to Adam in secret love or strange affinity? But the reason was of no importance. He would never again tempt by prayer any terrible power. If the picture was to alter, it was to alter. That was all. Why inquire too closely into it? All right, a rhetorical question here I think is, is interesting to consider, and maybe you should consider it as a reader. Maybe Wilde wants you to consider it as a reader. Who that knew anything about life, capitalized life, would surrender the chance of remaining always young, however fan fantastic that chance might be, or with what fateful consequences it might be fraught? Would you? Would you give up on um, eternal youth? How would eternal youth change you if you knew you were never going to age, never going to change, never going to grow old? How would that change you and your behaviors? If you knew none of your negative actions would have any impact upon your physical being, how would that change you? These are questions that Lord Henry, not Lord Henry, um, sorry, Oscar Wilde is asking the reader to think about. We'll finish the chapter. Um, for there would be a real pleasure in watching it. He would be able to follow his mind into its secret places. The portrait would be to him the most magical of mirrors. That's probably an allusion to Cinderella. Sleeping Beauty, Sleeping Beauty. As it had revealed to him his own body, it would reveal to him his own soul. Whoa, pause. So the picture first revealed to him his own beauty, his own body, and that knowledge uh, changed his behavior and his thought process. Now the picture is going to reveal to him his own soul. So the picture represents knowledge. If you go back to the, the Garden of Eden scene, what's most important there is that the tree represents knowledge. And we often talk about knowledge and civilization, but if you go to the Bible, the actual words describing the tree are knowledge of good and evil, knowledge of right and wrong. That's what the picture is to Dorian. He knows when he does something wrong, it shows up on the picture. So the picture represents knowledge of good and evil, and he's able to judge his actions based on what happens to the picture. Um, 
reveal to him his own body, it would reveal to him his own soul. And when winter came upon it, he would still be standing where a spring trembles on the verge of summer, when the blood crept from its face and left behind a pallid mask of chalk with leaden eyes. He would keep the glamour of boyhood. Not one blossom, flower image, of his loveliness would ever fade. Not one pulse of his life would ever weaken. Like the gods of the Greeks, he would be strong and fleet and joyous. What did it matter what happened to the colored image on the canvas? He would be safe. That was everything. Like the gods of the Greeks. He thinks of himself as a Greek god now. Uh, and in some ways he is. I mean, we've had how many uh, Greek allusions referencing Dorian himself, but now he's going to have eternal youth. And this pause, this always bothers me about the Greek gods. If the Greek gods... And this has nothing to do with the story. This is a tangent, and I'm sorry about this. But if the Greek gods don't age, right, if they stay the same age forever, how is Zeus old? Yeah, I don't know either. Um, you know, but why wouldn't they all be young and in the prime of their life? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, anyway, resume the story. Um, what did it matter what happened to the colored image on the canvas? He would be safe. That was everything. He drew the screen back into its former place in front of the picture, smiling as he did so, and passed into his bedroom, where his valet was already waiting for him. An hour later, he was at the opera, and Lord Henry was leaning over his chair. End of the chapter. He went to the opera. The day after his fiancée died, committed suicide, he went to the opera. What does that say about Dorian? Also, why does Oscar Wilde pick that very last line? He's at the opera and Lord Henry is leaning over his chair. What does this show? Why end the chapter in that way? I don't know if I mentioned this before, uh, but now seems like as good a time as any to mention it. The Picture of Dorian Gray was not first published as a novel. It was first published in Serial. So it came out quarterly or monthly or something like that in a magazine, and people had to wait, I think it was monthly, for the next chapter to come out. And so each chapter would have been like an episode on TV. Back before TV, people were waiting and speculating and wondering what was happening. And uh, Oscar Wilde was, was supposed to leave you with a cliffhanger or with something symbolic, something to discuss at the end of every chapter. And you can see this. Chapter ends with him being engaged to marry Sybil Vane. Chapter ends with a picture making a change. Chapter ends with Lord Henry leaning over his chair. So we can look at these chapter endings and see what they were designed to do, what kind of emotion they're designed to create in the reader, and what they reveal about the plot structure and the themes and the lessons and what's going on in the story. That's something else that you can think about as you continue to read the book. Next time we're going to hit chapter 9, um, in which... It's, a, it's sort of a mirror image chapter, and, and uh, Basil is going to show up to talk to Lord, or talk to Lord, talk to, talk to Dorian about Sybil's death. So we have Lord Henry talking to Dorian about Sybil's death. Now we're going to have Basil come and talk to Dorian about Sybil's death. And we'll see those two dueling influences and how those two encounters are, are similar and different, where they're parallel and where they're perpendicular i don't know um but i'm gonna i'm gonna shut up now and turn this thing off i hope you're enjoying the book as much as i am obviously i'm nerding out about this stuff this chapter's great uh and so is the next one so i'll look forward to seeing you soon